Uh, okay, so first, uh, thank you for inviting me to present in this workshop. I have been to, I think, all of them. Uh, I'm going to talk about how resource transport dynamics induces criticality in multilayer networks of excitable nodes. So it's a, kind of a long title, but I will explain what everything means. This work was done with Yogesh Birkar, my former student, uh, Woody Shu, and Edot. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, with a. So we're we are interested in critical dynamics in excitable systems, but in particular, one of the main applications is uh, in neural networks. And there is evidence that the brain operates near the critical point of a phase transition between too little and too much activity. And I'm going to summarize the the main experiment that um, demonstrates this. So what they, they measure the ongoing activity in cortical tissue, and they look at activity bursts called neuronal avalanches. They the size of these avalanches, and they look at the distribution of these sizes. And <clears throat> I'm showing here a cartoon of what it looks like. Of course, in the experiment, it's noisier. But uh, when when they give no drugs to the to the mice that are using the experiment, um, they they find that the distribution of these sizes is is a is a power law with exponent minus three over two, which corresponds to what you would obtain if you had um, a critical branching process. So if you were exactly in a critical branching process, which means that activity essentially is propagated from one time to the next without being amplified or or damped on average. If they give a drug that uh, enhances inhibition, then the distribution changes dramatically. It's, it's not a power law anymore. Uh, same thing if they give a drug that uh, decreases inhibition, so the, the, the behavior becomes like a supercritical branching process. So let me remind you that the behavior in the middle is when they don't give any drugs, so that's why it, um, it's, um, suggest, this suggests that the, the brain operates at, the, at this critical point. It has been shown that operating at this critical point has advantages for information processing. This is a, a, a review of different experiments and, and models. And there are different uh, specific uh, features of information processing that are uh, optimized when the, uh, when the brain operates at this point. So the question is, <clears throat> uh, well, can we see this in simple models? And the answer is, is yes. In fact, ex some experimental results have been predicted with really simple models, like the one I'm going to show, where neurons actually have discrete states. For example, one if the neuron is on, and zero if the neuron is off. Uh, in this model, we are going to, to assume that uh, a neuron N turns on at time t plus one uh, with a probability which is a sigmoid function of the input from all the neurons that are on, um, and meaning the input, uh, the, 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 the neurons that are connected to, neuro, to the neuron in question send signals that are weighted by uh, synapse weights that we encode in these coefficients a and m that form uh, the entries of an adjacency matrix. In this really simple model, then we can see the behavior that I showed you before. If the largest second value of this adjacency matrix is less than one, then we have a subcritical behavior. Uh, and I'm illustrating this here by plotting the fraction of excited nodes as a function of time. Uh, we added some noise here to prevent the activity from dying completely, but you see that the activity uh, meaning the fraction of excited nodes is really small, uh, as opposed to, for example, when you get when you have an eigenvalue which is bigger than one, then in this case activity tends to be uh, amplified and you end up with a very large fraction of excited nodes as a function of time. Um, in the middle of between these two regimes, you have the critical point where the eigenvalue is exactly one, and then you have large fluctuations in um, network activity, and this is what in this model. Uh, corresponds to to the the regime where the brain is seen to operate. Assuming that it is beneficial to operate in this regime, the main question is <clears throat> how do how does the brain actually self regulate to operate near this critical point? And this is an important question because uh, synapse strengths are constantly changing due to many factors, in particular learning. So when learning, some synapse strengths increase and, and others decrease. And in in terms of this model that I showed. Uh, the matrix entries are would be changing, and then therefore the eigenvalue would be changing. Um, there are natural fluctuations, the brain being a biological system, and also <clears throat> synapse strengths could effectively change due to availability of metabolic resources. So the question is how do how does the the brain actually regulate all these to to operate at the critical point of this phase transition? Um, and we are going to propose a model where we actually leverage this last point. We are going to use the availability of resources to actually regulate the network. 
Uh, this is work that we published last year, and I have to say is partly motivated by work um, by Nicosian collaborators, in particular Sebastian Skardal is one of the co-authors who he spoke yesterday. Uh, although we are going to apply their idea to to this particular problem of the of the of operating at the at the critical point of these phase transitions. To do that, we are going to consider a multi-layer network where the there are going to be two layers. The one of the layers is going to be the neuronal network, which is shown here in the bottom. So this is a schematic showing how how this works. We have the neurons. Then we have a secondary network, which is the, a, new, a network of glial cells, which are cells that take resources from the bloodstream, shown uh, here in the upper part. They take resources from the bloodstream, and they, then they distribute, it, they distribute these resources to the synapses of, uh, that connect different neurons. And this is so because the synapses are, in principle, they can be very far away from the neuron body, so it's more efficient to have the glial cells distribute the resources to the synapses. And resources uh, can... Uh, also diffuse between uh, glial cells. So schematically, this model uh, is going to be like this. So we have two layers, a neuronal layer and a glial uh, cell layer. And then we have re a resource, which we don't specify here, but there are many different or various different resources that uh, could play this role. They are supplied by the bloodstream to the glial cells, which are the stars on top. So they, and I hope you can see the animation uh, but the resource is, is supplied to the glial cells. It can diffuse between glial cells. So the, the secondary layer is an undirected network. And from the, a glial cell, the resource can diffuse to the synapses connecting different neurons. And when, an, when, a, when a neuron fires, then the resource that is in the corresponding synapse is consumed. So there's going to be an interplay between the supply and consumption of resources that will regulate the network to operate at this critical point. So in the moment, we're going to have N neurons labeled with little n. The glial cells are going to be labeled with I, and the synapses are going to be labeled with um, eta. Uh, OK, so in way that the, the resource dynamics is coupled to the, to the operation of the neural network is in that we are going to assume that the Synapse strengths that are these coefficients uh, a and m that appear in the model. We are going to assume that they are proportional to the amount of resource present at the synapse. So we have the resource at the synapse that's going to be big R sub n m uh, for the synapse connect, connect, connecting neuron m to neuron n, and uh, this is a proportionality constant that in this talk I'm going to take uh, to take it to dependent of time. But in principle, what can allow this part of the synapse to uh, encode learning, as we did in the paper. But for now, we uh, let's just suppose that it's a, a constant, and the synapse weight just depends on the on the resource that is present. So let me describe um, that re represent the model that I showed you in the, in the previous cartoon. So this is the uh, evolution of the resource at any glial cell at a given glial cell i. So it changes, and I'm going to explain this. It looks good for now, but it will be if I explain every term. Uh, the resource changes by this term here, which represents diffusion between the glial cell I and other glial cells J that are connected to it in the upper um, network. And these and these entries U just tell us which glial cells are, are connected with to which other glial cells. This is the diffusion coefficient between glial cells. Then we have diffusion between the glial cell I and the synapses that the glial cell uh, supplies resources to. So these are the synapses eta and this coefficient or these entries G tell us which synapses are served by the glial cell I. So this is again just diffusion between glial cell and the glial cell and the synapses. And finally, we have this term that represents the source of uh, metabolic resource from the bloodstream to the glial cell. So this is just what I in the cartoon in the in the in the animation in equation form. Then we have the resource dynamics at a given synapse eta. It changes according to the diffusion from the glial cell that is supplying resources to the synapse. So this is the diffusion, and I forgot the um, assuming this is the diffusion from the glial cell to the synapse. And then we have the consumption of the resource if the pressing up neuron uh, m corresponding to the synapse fires, meaning that this S becomes one, then resource is consumed an amount B. So 
uh, this is the, the the amount that is consumed when a uh, fires. This is the, the the amount that is consumed when a uh, fires. Finally, we make sure that this uh, is positive. Mm, okay, so this specifies the model. We can take we can take this model and uh, first simulate it numerically. So we can we can just set up different initial conditions and different networks. And what we see is that when we simulate these networks and the eigenvalue is, for example, below one, then it evolves in such a way that uh, ends up close to lambda equal one. So the network regulates itself to operate at the critical, at the critical point. Same thing if the eigenvalue is bigger than one, then it uh, reaches uh, one relatively quickly. And the, <clears throat> the explanation for this is uh, intuitively clear. So if the network is super critical, if the eigenvalue is bigger than one, then as I showed you at the beginning, there is going to be a lot of firing and before resource is going to be consumed, uh, bringing the synapses down and then um, the eigenvalue will accordingly come down. Similarly, if the eigenvalue is less than one, then there is going to be too little activity and resource will be accumulating until it reaches the, the point where um, the eigenvalue is one. Uh, <clears throat> One question is how, how does this intuitive picture hold for different parameters? So is this true for different parameter choices? Because we have different parameters such as diffusion coefficients, source rates, and so on. And we would like to know if this actually is robust to changes in parameters. For example, here we are uh, looking at another measure of criticality, which is the distribution of, uh, of avalanches that I mentioned at the beginning. So we can define avalanches for for our model, um, and we can look at the distribution, look at the distribution for different parameters. If, for example, here we are changing uh, the source rate on the on this axis, and we are looking at a log log uh, uh, plot of the distribution of of size. And the blue curves here correspond to distributions that pass a, a test, a statistical test for for a power law distribution. While the red curves are the, those who those which don't, and so we see that in the first in the first place we we see that there is a large parameter range where we have a, a relative distribution corresponding to a critical, uh, but there are some some parameter regimes where the distribution doesn't is not a power law. In particular, it looks really like a supercritical distribution. So the question is, when can we expect this 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 system to actually uh, in the the operation of the, bring the system to the critical state. To get insight into this, we can look at homogeneous networks, and I'm not going to show the details, but we can look at homogeneous networks, and in this case, we can de approximately describe this the the, the system by a three-dimensional map. Just like in value, the total resource in the synapses and total resource in the gale cells, and for this map, uh, the state with lambda equal one, so the critical state is a fixed point, and therefore we can look at the stability of this uh, fixed point using uh, the route Horowitz criterion, and we get inequalities for the for the par uh, parameters that tell us uh, when the critical state is going to be stable. So we can we can actually know when this is going to work, and we can confirm that it works for a large range uh, of uh, parameters. So I'm going to finish with one important comment, which is it seems so far we don't really need a network, a secondary network because it seems like everything is just an interplay between supply and consumption of resources. So I'm going to show an example here of how actually the secondary network, the upper layer, the glial network, actually can stabilize the operation of the primary network. So here I'm showing an example where we take, instead of a, a constant value of, sor of source rate C1, we take a heterogeneous distribution. So each glial cell will have its own source rate. And this distribution is going to be chosen such that some of the glial cells get a parameter that would make the, the system unstable if all of them have the same value, and some of them will have a parameter that would be stable. So if we take this distribution, then it turns out that having the secondary network makes the system stable. So we can, so I'm showing here the experiment where we distribution and then turn the glial network off so we effectively eliminate diffusion between glial, cell, glial cells, 
And in this case, what happens is that some, some glial cells are accumulating resource and they, they, they cannot get rid of it and the whole network becomes unstable. On the other hand, if, if diffusion between the glial cells is allowed, then they can ex essentially share the excess resource and, and the whole network is stabilized or can operate at the critical point. Um, okay, so I'm going to summarize to stop here. We have seen that interactions between multilayer networks can have important dynamical consequences that can be can be exploited um, uh, beneficially. Uh, in this particular system, we saw that resource transport robustly stabilizes the critical state in networks of excitable systems. I, I, I use the language of neuronal networks, but there are other systems that uh, where this could be applied. And I, the thing that I didn't show because of time constraints, but I think it's important, and it, it can be shown that this um, mechanism that we used can stabilize the, the, the critical system even after learning. And after the, the system is stabilized again to the critical state, the learned pattern in the network remains. So this, this could be used to, to stabilize the, the network um, uh, while learning. And I will stop here.